On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, China is the world's largest shipbuilder. I'm your host, Sal Mercaglion, and welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you can learn about new videos as they come out. Well, just got back from a week at Wilmington for the North American Society for Oceanic History. And as you can see, still quite hasn't recovered from the week. So I'll be back in form starting the next episode. But for right now, I want to talk about a story that hit on CNN just the other day that talks about China's shipbuilding program and the impact it's going to have not just on naval and military, but also on commercial. Because China has emerged as the world's largest shipbuilder of both naval vessels and commercial vessels, but not just for itself. <laughs> Okay, this is a lot, but this is the launch of the newest Chinese aircraft carrier, the Fushan uh, 003. Uh, the Chinese have two aircraft carriers. One of them, 001, was a modification of a former Russian vessel. 002 was their own purpose-built carrier. Now we have 003. And, and this carrier is the first super carrier being built by the Chinese. Uh, this carrier is a supercarrier. It is not as large as a Ford class aircraft carrier, but it is massive, 80,000 tons. It is about the size or larger than conventional aircraft carriers the United States ran. And this aircraft carrier poses a severe test to the U.S. military and it, the ability of the Chinese to power project. So the story is entitled, Never Mind China's New Aircraft Carrier. These are the ships the U.S. should worry about. And the CNN story goes in and obviously talks about the launch of the aircraft carrier, but then talks about the fact that the Chinese are mass producing other vessels, what's called the Type 055 destroyer, which is coming out in large numbers, which is equivalent to the Arleigh Burke destroyers of the US Navy, the Type 039 submarine, which is a diesel electric submarine, not nuclear powered, but very silent, very difficult to detect. And most importantly, they talk about commercial building, in particularly the construction of merchant ferries, which are roll on roll off vessels, which could be used to support a potential invasion of Taiwan, for example, and the Chinese maritime militia. All of those provide elements that that assist the Chinese military, the maritime militia in particularly are being used in the South China Sea, and around the world's oceans to stake claims for Chinese interests. Many times they follow their fishing fleet and their fishing fleet has been pushing in against the edge of the economic exclusion zones of many countries around the world and not just in Asia, but as far away as South America and Africa. And that brings me to the point of this video is to talk about how the Chinese maritime merchant marine connections are so important to understand because China is emerging as really the largest commercial builder in the world. Now, the other two are Japan and Korea, but there's basically an arms race between those three countries to see who will emerge as the dominant force. So this is a story back in May, John Conrad on GCAP, and China's militarized seafarers says U.S. Navy report. Over the many years of reporting maritime news, the idea that China could militarize its commercial maritime fleet has been dismissed by most of the shipping community, but a new report published by the U.S. Naval War College shows that this is not only a possibility, but has already been accomplished. And this report is key. One of the things that the, the report's entitled Civilian Shipping and Maritime Militia, the Logistics Backbone of a Taiwan Invasion. Here's a copy of the report. Of course, I'll have this in the show notes for you. It's done by the U.S. Naval War College, their China Maritime Studies Program. And as the report basically spells out, is the Chinese are doing very unique things. For example, their commercial mariners are all trained in military aspects, something that the US merchant marine does no longer do. Used to do it, but we don't do that anymore. So for example, their training includes marshalling and assembling and sailing in formation, convoying, use of military communication equipments and procedures, self-defense and mutual defense, rescue and first aid, military loading and unloading equipment. It's not, you know, military loading equipment is different than commercial loading because you need to offload vehicles in a set manner or cargo in a set manner. There's combat loading versus what, what are basically routine loading. 
uh, basic knowledge of operating environments from a military perspective, operations of equipment particular to assigned support tasks, knowledge about their supported units and their roles in the unit's missions, and knowledge about enemy threats they will face, topics such as dockless unloading. How do you offload what's, quote, in stream? How do you offload when you're at anchor, to lighters, to barges, to smaller craft to run that ashore? And I think that is a major issue. Now, some have dismissed this idea of using commercial ships by the Chinese in a military role. Oh, we have these guided missiles. We have these guided bombs that will neutralize it. But do you have enough of them? Because the Chinese merchant marine is huge. And also, how do you differentiate between Chinese vessels and other vessels in a place like the Taiwan Strait that is the most densely shipping lane in the world? And that raises a lot of questions. Add to it the Chinese military, which has only one base overseas in Djibouti in Eastern Africa, but it has interest in ports around the world from a tweet I did talking about the Chinese and their port interests. This is very similar to what the British did long before the Royal Navy became the dominant force on the world's oceans in the 17th and 18th centuries. They used their commercial firms to seek interests establish commercial ports and build themselves up. And this issue is obviously a fairly major one. And one of the things that uh, John puts in here is a couple of questions. Can the US ships even get to China in a fight? And what lessons are we learning from Ukraine? The other element here is China is building vessels of huge proportions. The same yards that are building the Chinese aircraft carriers, their cruisers, their destroyers, their frigates, their submarines are building commercial vessels. This article by Mike Scholler, China delivers the first 24,000 plus TEU, TEU container ship ever a lot. The seventh vessel in the Ever A class is coming out of China. And one of the things that we're seeing here is how influential China has become in commercial ship construction, not just for themselves, but for other countries. Here's video showing the launch of Ever a lot. You can see the size of her, just a mammoth vessel. And one of the things that you need to launch these vessels are massive dry docks. These ships are built in floating or in dry docks and then floated out. You see the size of these ships. And one of the things to note is these ships are being built for Evergreen. This is Taiwan. This is the Republic of China. The People's Republic of China, Communist China, is building the fleet for Taiwan, the, the country that many people believe China wants to invade. And this construction of vessels like this requires China to build massive dry docks, massive cranes to build ships of this scope and this scale. And a recent report highlighted the danger of China building these ships. This story also in G-Captain back in April is Taiwan's Evergreen helping to finance China's naval expansion. And in particularly what they're looking at is a report that was done by the Center for Strategic and International Studies. This report right here, In the Shadow of Warships, How Foreign Companies Help Modernize China's Navy. The construction of vessels in China by commercial firms allows China to basically develop the infrastructure to support its Navy. Right here, you see a chart from 2020 showing the fact that China is building 40% of the world ships, and then you have 31% in South Korea, 22% Japan. The latest uh, review of maritime transport has this largely about that same level. And what this is doing is allowing the Chinese Navy to build more vessels than, for example, the US Navy, because we're not building commercial ships. And our shipyards are devoted solely, almost exclusively to building military ships, vice commercial ships. And these J Chinese shipyards that are located along the coast. And China really has three main areas of, of, of shipping, the north, the central, and then the southern area. And they kind of match up right with those areas. And you can see right here in these constructions, here's the construction of the Chinese supercarrier, the 003. And then here you see the launching of the large Ever A's class vessels being built those dry docks, those facilities, those steel manufacturing engines, everything they need are all being used right there. And so Taiwan 
is contributing to the Chinese naval buildup, even though the greatest threat to Taiwan is the Chinese naval buildup. And you're sitting there going, oh man, man, why would China, Taiwan do that? Who in their right mind would do that? Well, there's another country doing it too. It's us. And when I say us, I mean US, the United States of America. Story from Mike Schuller, Matson's 2018 built Daniel K. Inoue to undergo LNG engine conversion. Now, this ship was built up at the Philadelphia shipyard, which was the former Philadelphia Navy shipyard. It was built in a dry dock that was designed to launch Montana class battleships in World War II. And this ship was configured so that it can switch over to LNG propulsion. Its engines were designed with that. All you need to do is a conversion to this. And Matson has contracted with Man Energy Solutions to retrofit the vessels. The story is they're going to China to go do this. Now understand, going into a Chinese shipyard to convert a vessel that is used exclusively on the West Coast to the Hawaii run means that you're putting a a American ship in a Chinese shipyard for a long period of time. Matter of fact, the Chinese have told Matson that they can remove their crew and their engineers so that their workers can do the work solely without anyone on board. Although you can get third party to watch them, there is a question about what the Chinese will be doing on that ship. If I'm the Chinese and I'm planning at some point in the future for a potential offensive action, one of the things I'd want to do is take out the communication between the United States West Coast and its main forward operating areas in the Pacific, Hawaii and Guam, which mats in services. And here's an opportunity to do it. You can ask the question, well, why is Matson going to China? Because the Chinese yards are offering low, low prices to do it. So low that they're crazy not to do it. And they would lose money going somewhere else. And the question is, why is China offering that? Is because they want to get on board these ships. And again, this has the potential to disrupt American national security with this, we just saw an example of this when the President Wilson with Madeleine Walchko and the crew went into a shipyard in Shanghai for a 30 day shipyard period, and they were in there for over 100 days. Story right here on, uh, on the Wall Street Journal, focusing in on restricted to ship, talking about this story. Uh, Madeleine and the crew, matter of fact, just returned, just pulled back in to Los Angeles, Long Beach, and I got a picture of Madeline heading home on board an airplane. So this story right here is a great one to kind of capsulate on here, is how we are shifting a lot of our industrial base overseas. We don't have the shipyard capacity. We don't have the means to repair our own vessels. We don't have the means to build our own vessels. And again, one of the critiques against this and the criticisms that come against building in the United States is, it's five to six times more expensive to build a ship in the United States. Well, I don't, first of all, I, I disagree with that cost. I think that's a bogus cost. Is it more expensive? Yes, it is. And the reason is very simple. The U.S. doesn't build enough ships. When you build a ship overseas and you build 20 of them to a model, and then you build 10 more for another company of the same design, or if you modify it, shrink it, increase it in size, you've got the plates already set. You've got all the all all, all the, the dies cut. Everything is done. You know, it's like getting the Lego Maersk ship and putting it together. You know, you buy the kit and you put it together. It's great. Well, guess what? If you decide to build your own Lego Maersk ship, but you don't have the pieces, but you got to make your own pieces, that's going to cost you a heck of a lot more money. That's what we're doing in the US versus what's going on in Japan, South Korea, and uh, China. And you can sit there and say, well, let's just build ships in South Korea and Japan. They're our allies. The problem is Japan, South Korea, and China are right next to each other. And those yards are within range of each other. And the potential disruption is that a war in East Asia could disrupt not just their economy, but the world's economy. Look what's happening in the Black Sea. Look what's happening in Ukraine. Look at what we're seeing with grain and oil prices today. This is an issue that we need to be aware of. China is poised to really accelerate it into the 21st century as the dominant maritime force in the world. And again, if you don't believe me, pick up Greg Easterbrook's uh, book, uh, The Blue Age. Pick up uh, Bruce Jones's book, 
to rule uh, to rule the waves, or pick up the latest Peter Z handbook that talks about these issues. And geopolitics is a very important aspect. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, contribute to the page by either becoming a patron of the page by going over to the Patreon page or hit that super thanks button and contributing to the page. As you can see, I am in desperate need of a shave and new clothes coming back from a conference that has taken the life out of me. But now it's over and I can devote myself to you, the fans and subscribers to what's going on with shipping. Till our next video, Sal, signing off.